So excited to introduce Margaret Morrison, who is the current professor, full professor of art and area chair for drawing and painting at the University of Georgia and the Lamar Dodd School of Art. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, Margaret is known for her incredibly detailed still life and surreal figurative paintings that are simply delicious to look at and thought for provoking to view as well. Morrison earned her MFA from the University of Utah and has exhibited in museums and institutions around the world, including the Georgia Museum of Art, Yellowstone Art Museum in Montana, the Rockefeller Museum of uh, Museum and Art Center in New York, and in 2012 was invited by the director of the Department of State Art and Embassies program to display her painting Cat Eyes in the ambassador's residence in Tel Aviv. Uh, which is really exciting. <laughs> Her art has been featured in the New York Times, Art News, Art and Antiques, In Magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, Florida Design, Juxtapose, Aesthetica Magazine, International, Pinch Magazine, Agave Magazine, Wide Walls, and the Georgia Review, and that's just to name a few. Morrison has been represented by Woodward Gallery since 1995, and her work can be found in many public and private collections around the world. So welcome, Margaret. We are so excited to have you. Um, I'm really excited to learn more because you've had such an interesting background and way you got into art. So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and start sharing your screen. And we can go ahead and get started with the questions. Oh, but before you do, uh, if you are on here and you would like to share what your what artwork you're working on, um, we'll go ahead and uh, hold it up to the camera. Uh, if you are working on some of the uh, coloring pages or your own coloring page, and then at the end we will um, we'll all share what we've been working on at the end of this. So, Margaret, I'll go ahead and let you uh, share your screen now. Christina, thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Um, and I'm really excited for, uh, to learn about this. Um, how did you get into art and uh, what influences you with your art? Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about them one by one. So, influence number one. <laughs> I grew up as the youngest of six daughters. So as you can imagine, I never got a word in edgewise. So I'm the little short one on the end. And so I learned early on to be the observer. And it was almost like a magical play constantly. I just learned vicariously through my sisters. And as you can see, <laughs> I am the little one on the end. And my parents had this proclivity to have us all lined up like this for photographs. And again, here we are <laughs> from eldest to youngest. And this actually was very profound for me to just be constantly feeling like I was in the audience watching actors on stage and paying careful attention to what was going on around me. Influence number two. When I was eight years old, my father, who was, who was a, a, a hydrometallurgist and professor at the University of Utah, was invited by the Ford Foundation to set up a graduate department, a graduate school at the University of the Philippines. And so he took his family, five of the six daughters, wife and even the dog. And we packed up and moved to Manila for, for a couple of years. And while there, my father would, would plan these, these elaborate itineraries. And so we, we traveled extensively. This is actually a photograph of me just from the Pasag River looking at, at uh, the street in Manila and just soaking in all of the color and the new experiences and just realizing that what I thought was a big world was, was just the tip of the iceberg. Here I am with my sisters in Bangkok. So we traveled the Orient and went to all the major museums of Europe. So I, you know, by the time I was 10, I probably seen more artwork than a lot of people see in a lifetime. And honestly, it, 
it had a tremendous effect on me. And I remember just wandering through these magnificent rooms, looking at these, these historical paintings and, and just room after room of, of this glorious work. And I, and I have a very distinct memory of approaching a Dutch still life and, and getting so close, I'm practically with my nose against the painting and alarming the guards, of course, but really studying the, the transparencies, the reflections, the kind of the beauty of the surface. I noticed that the last element that was added to the painting were, were the highlights. And I was just absolutely transfixed by, uh, by the optical illusion that was created out of paint. And I remember standing there in the Louvre and thinking, I gotta figure that out. I have to get my head wrapped around this and I have to figure out the alchemy of this magic because it's fascinating to me, looking at like little drops of water, little tiny, um, like the little snail there in, in, the, in the foreground, the reflection of the window in the vase. And I thought, yeah, I've got to figure that out. And then of course, food was obviously something that I also found really appealing in terms of these paintings. So here are some of some early still lives that date back several decades. So probably from the 1990s. And as you can see, I'm using a similar format to these Dutch paintings. There's a horizontal tabletop. The, the objects are arranged slightly below eye level. There is a beautiful raking light source. I'm looking for transparencies and reflections. I love trying to figure out and analyze metal and, and, uh, and, and ceramic surfaces and so, and linens as well. I also was very intrigued by the, the arched uh, altarpiece format. I even started figuring out some woodworking and, and the, this little triptych actually has wings that open and close on it. So you can see there are little small hinges on it. All right, influence number three is that I'm, I'm one of the blessed artists on the planet because years ago in New York City, I was having a show in a co-op gallery in Soho when uh, John Woodward of Woodward Gallery walked in, saw my work, and then called me out of the blue and said, I would like to invite you to be in, in the stable of Woodward Gallery. And that has been a fortuitous relationship with John and Christine Woodward since the mid 1990s. And so we've been dear friends and the gallery and, and my career have just been side by side uh, all the way since the mid 90s. And, and I consider them like family. Uh, John was uh, approached the Gourmet Garage, which at the time was on the uh, corner of, I believe, Mercer and Broom, and uh, and approached the the owner and said, you know, this is such a fabulous location. What if I build these these display boxes in each window and then feature artists from Woodward Gallery? And so. Um, the, the owner of the Gourmet Garage was excited about this possibility. John built these beautiful display windows and then invited me to make a series of paintings that, that would uh, be featured in the windows. And I thought, wow, Gourmet Garage, we're talking food. So I wanted to go all out and show um, the, the beauty of, of food and, and these surfaces. So, um, here are a couple of the, the still lifes that I painted for those windows. It was really funny because when I bought all of these 
these <laughs> onions and I'd take them to the uh, checkout counter at, at the store and the, <laughs> the cashier would look at me like, what are you gonna make with all of that? Um, so I'd set them up on my studio floor and look down and, and paint them. It just so happened that the Gourmet Garage was very pleased with the work that was in the windows and so invited me to paint a mural for the inside of the store. So this is, this is a, a, a mural, as you can see, a, a different scale. This is a much larger scale than I had ever painted a still life before. And to be honest, it was so much fun. So I loved painting shrimps that were just enormous and, and these lemons that, that were just, you, you feel like you could hold them like, like, like a big watermelon. They were such large scale. So it was a real pleasure to paint these. All right, influence number four. My father had a tremendous sweet tooth. And so every week, almost every week, we would go to the drive-in movie theater and watch movies, which is definitely a 1960s, 1970s pastime. But before we showed up, we would go to the drugstore and wander up and down the aisles looking, lured in by beautiful wrappers and cellophane and colors and just the promise of something decadent and delicious. And so that was, that was definitely a family ritual to go before we would go to the movies. So I fell in love with sweets just like my father. <laughs> Another place that he would take us would to be the ice cream store the, in our neighborhood. And believe it or not, this, this um, sign with a double ice cream cone would spin around and as you, I remember pulling up to this and seeing the ice cream spinning around and just dreaming about how magnificent it would be to actually have an ice cream cone that size. <laughs> I still recall what my father ordered. It, it came in a great big boat and it had like three different scoops of caramel ice cream with caramel drizzled on top with cashews on it. And it was, it was just practically obscene. So put those together, sweets on a really large scale, and, and I, I started painting these, these really big still lifes. And I, I just enjoyed the elements that I had used earlier. I was looking for transparencies. I was looking for how light would bounce around on the objects, looking for how the reflected light was picking up the objects from right next to it and trying to analyze how to paint glass by seeing what I what was apparent through the glass and seeing the distortions. So a, a lot of fun to paint. Mm -hmm. I also did another series of paintings for the gourmet garage windows and and these paintings I call sexy sweet. So why that, sexy sweet? What, well, because they, they look a little naughty. <laughs> <laughs> There's just something really sensuous about them and decadent and luscious and you know, kind of over the top voluptuousness. You know, that's one thing that we talk about in this exhibition is with our relationship with food, um, how would you actually verbalize and describe that? So when I do virtual tours for our students, um, it's something, it's always the kind of end exercise. Okay, if you're going to describe your favorite dessert to someone, half the time I, I have to use the example to an alien from Mars, <laughs> what, how would you do that? What word, assuming we speak the same language, how would you do that? And and so it's constantly trying to get them away from like physical descriptors because our relationship with food isn't just the physical, it's not just sustenance. A lot of times, particularly if we have a favorite food, it, it's a relationship that's built uh, into it. Absolutely, it is. Um, you know, I think about sugar and, and I do blame my father for this. 
it it meant it was the the equivalent of family good time good conversation entertainment joy happiness so sugar equaled all of those things absolutely and plus for me this was just fun I would sometimes go to Kroger and just walk up and down the aisles looking for objects to paint because they just looked fun. So I have a, I have another question then. Um, if, you know, obviously what's around you is a, is a big influence still, but I, I kind of want to go back to that museum thing because I also grew up uh, for four years in a different country. And anytime we traveled as a family, we always made sure every new place we went, we would go and visit a museum. Um, and so I, I, feel, I feel a very, <laughs> a connection with your story to my story that, um, but I, I mean, that's the whole reason I'm in a museum profession is because museums I found were like an anchor point. Right. Um, and so anytime I travel, uh, you know, now that I work in a museum with my office has no windows, I tend to be outside more than I, than I used to as a kid, but I still really love, I still gravitate towards museums. And I wonder if, if you have something like that, that do you still go back and, and, and continue to be influenced by those Dutch still life? Do you, do you visit museums as you travel? Oh my goodness. Yes, particularly uh, because I've had the opportunity for the last 10 years to teach for our study abroad program in Cortona, Italy. And uh, normally go in the summers when there are around 90, 90 students and many of those students take painting. And so I uh, take those students with me in the streets of Cortona and Rome and um, there are beautiful little museums right in Cortona. There, there's a, from medieval artwork to um, um, Etruscan ware that is just spectacular. And then we travel to Florence, we travel to Siena, we go to Orvieto, we go to Arezzo. And, and so we're traveling all around and seeing all of these major museums. It honestly, for these students, it's almost like drinking from a fire hose. But, but while they're looking at the work, I'm rediscovering this, this work as well and just, just kind of bathing in it. And, and what I would say too, is that every time that I've gone, I have taken my children with me and the, um, my daughter Emily was was 13 the first time I took her, and <laughs> I laugh about this because when I first, when, you know, she was young enough that we were probably going to about 15 museums within a span of a few weeks, and she w was getting to the point where, oh no, not another museum! I don't know if I can take it. Well, last year, she just completed her master's degree in art history. So, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would say that all of those trips to all those museums that, that at, at first I was dragging her to obviously had a major impact on her. And, and I would say too that a, a major impact on my newest body of work uh, stemmed from all of these magnificent antique fairs that are in these Tuscan towns. And this, this is Arezzo, and you can see the vendors are, uh, they have their tables spread out with all of these beautiful antiques. And these are, this is, these are some of the oldest antique markets in the world. You know, in the United States, we think we've got, we've got the handle on antiques. We, we have no idea <laughs> how many antiques are flowing through these beautiful Tuscan towns. And so I was just absolutely transfixed by, by the, the, you know, the beauty of these objects. So on that one street in Arezzo, I stumbled onto a table that had nothing but this gorgeous sterling silver on it. And what I noticed right off the bat is that, that the vendor 
very carefully selected the color of backdrop, place on the table, and then place all the objects on top of. And he was also very careful on orchestrating whether a very, very shiny object was placed next to a more matte finished uh, piece. And, um, and so everything was curated very carefully. So in, in some ways, I almost feel like uh, with me painting his, his still life, it was a, a, a somewhat of a collaboration. And if you notice too, if you look in these objects, you can see the buildings and the street and even my self portrait uh, in, in all of these objects. So that's, it, that's so interesting because the, the, the still lifes, you have a, a something that was re like, particularly in the Dutch with all the flowers and everything, these, they were, they had just been alive and they're still sort of alive. Um, but by get, by painting them, you are in fact continuing the life of it. And so I, I see in this, and this is probably just me reading into it with your reflection and, and everything into it, that you're almost giving it not just a collaboration, but its own new life. Um, and, and creating this whole different vocabulary with still life almost. I would say that that's true. And uh, it was, uh, it was something that I wanted to try again on a very massive scale. So, so this particular painting is six feet high and eight feet wide. And so uh, I just, how can I say it? I, it was a self-indulgent effort because mm -hmm. I, I adore painting reflections. And so I thought I am going to just completely bury myself in reflective objects. And there's no way I could possibly afford all of these objects. I would love to do that. And up until this point, I had always arranged my own still lives. But here for the first time, someone else had done the arranging for me. And, and so, and, and I will say too, that I, when I go and document the, these antique fairs, I take probably around, you know, maybe 300 photographs. And then I curate and look through the photographs and then I will digitally um, enhance what I want to or, or play up the contrast that I want to or crop out objects that I'm not interested in. So there's, there's a lot of work after the documentation that, that I use. So what you're saying is your paintings are also another embodiment of a museum. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, you're a curator in your own right. <laughs> right, right. Uh huh. Well, I thought it would be interesting too uh, if folks wanted to see how how my paintings develop. And Absolutely. So, uh, this is this is stage one where I I quickly map out where the objects are and the scale of the objects, and um, keeping it pretty loose. And then I, I normally, and it's not always, but normally I'll, I'll put a, a red ground underneath just um, to help me to calibrate uh, the value system better. Mm -hmm. Then I start fleshing out the objects, but I don't allow myself to get lured in to finishing anything at this point. I just am I'm, I'm looking at uh, working very generally and then moving all the way around the canvas. So as you can see, I started off in the lower corner and so, you know, sometimes I can't help myself. I go in and I do a little bit of tweaking, but I try to make myself not get too invested in an area before I completely cover the entire field. And then I thought, I don't know if you can notice, but in, toward the center is a cat. And I thought, oh, the cat has a face. I love faces. I'll start with a cat because it's something I can relate to and it's something familiar. But then I thought, holy cow, the reflections on the back were way beyond me at this point. So I kind of had to abandon the cat and start to move around to, to different areas. So this is a little bit of a close-up. So you can see that... Um, 
oftentimes I will, I will flesh out an area and then I'll come back to it, pull it up again into a little bit more definition. And then I'll come back again, pull it up again. And then as you noticed in the, in the right hand image, I finally figured out how to paint the reflections on the back. And it was simply because I painted all the objects around the cat first. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to the cat, I recognized the objects that were then reflected in the back of the cat. And, and it made me realize that it's not enough just to work from a photograph. I had to be able to, to envision what the photograph was conveying to me, not just, you know, um, copy work, but, but really just kind of a deep level analysis of what it was that I was painting. Because honestly, I would say that I edit out a lot of information. This is a highly complex image and there was no way I could put everything in. So in a lot of ways, I, th this would not be strict photorealism. It is still, I'm, I'm still dropping out a heck of a lot of information. So here is like the, the next to the last stage and there's the finish. So you can see how I, I build up, like um, I tell my students, it's like baking a cake. You don't want to put the icing on until you have the, the cake solidly built. And so I, I like to make sure that I've pulled up the value system. I've pulled up the color systems before I go in for the kill on, on um, the level of, of detail. Hey, Margaret, we have a question from the chat. Um, oh. Cynthia wants to know how long did this painting take? Oh, okay. I worked on this piece for about six months. Oh, wow. And so I, I have a question that kind of uh, goes off of that. Um, so I was introduced to your work uh, by a collector here who I think is on the call. Uh, and she has small paintings of yours. When did you really, like, first off, what is the biggest painting that you've ever done? Is it this uh, kind of six by six? Um, and then also, did you, did you start small in your career and then, and then uh, work your way up to these bigger ones? Or has it always kind of been um, kind of back and forth? I, this was, up to this point, this was the largest painting I had ever done. I was so excited about the image that I just kind of wanted to go big or go home. <laughs> so I decided that I wanted to, to paint it on a scale that uh, where, and, and it's hard to tell this, but if you, if you get up close to this painting, you can, you can really see that the surface has a lot of paint built up on it. When it's condensed down to the scale, it, it looks hyper-realistic, but in person, it, it, it doesn't appear that way. And so I wanted it to be on a scale where I could load up a brush with paint and deposit that paint on the surface and have it be a real tangible painted mark. Awesome. Uh, largest painting that, that I've painted is actually behind me right now. And, and this piece that I'm working on is nine feet high. That's amazing. Um, is it finished yet or are you still working on it? It's close. It's close, but I'm still working on it. How long have, how long have you been working on it? Um, oh gosh, I think probably about six months. <laughs> quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> quarantine. It's <a> good quarantine <laughs> project. <laughs> All right. So, and this piece now is, is hanging at the Georgia Museum of Art in Athens. This gives you a better idea of the scale. Yeah, absolutely. And then this is a companion piece. Believe it or not, when I was in Arezzo, this painting was, or, or this, this setup, uh, this vendor was directly across the street from the sterling silver vendor. And so honestly, that day I felt like I died and gone to heaven. So here is uh, the beginning of, of this piece. And then this, again, starting to flesh out the objects, trying not to get too involved with finish at the very beginning and then moving around this way. So at this point, 
I could then start to go in and pull up the development on a slightly different scale. So this gives you an idea by zooming in on one particular object, you can see how um, I, I developed the painting. So flushing it out first, getting an overall value system, trying to get the ellipses accurate. Um, a lot of this is freehand, it's, it's all freehand. And then- hey, Margaret, we have a question from the chat uh, from okay. Tina and she says, your work always evokes nostalgic feelings. Do they bring similar feelings for you personally? And do your viewers connect to your works in this way? I, yes, I think these are very nostalgic and, and I, to me, they represent my love for Italy and, and uh, particularly that area of Tuscany. So, so these particular pieces are very nostalgic. They really do resonate on that level with me. It, it, a lot of it is about memory. I think that's true. I forgot the other half of that question. Um, she was asking, do you think that your viewers connect to your works in that nostalgic way as well? I, I've had people tell me that. Um, and you know, what's really kind of fun is that I had this painting posted on my Instagram page and the vendor recognized her table. And so <laughs> she started, she started uh, messaging me back and forth on Instagram in, in Italian. It's like, oh, I can't believe you painted my table. <laughs> and so because of that, uh, she wants to meet with me the next time I'm in Italy and we'll have our pictures taken together. And I thought- That's amazing. So. Uh, that, that's really amazing. We have another question from the chat um, from Cynthia. How do you know what color to use before bringing the features out? Oh, gosh. Oh, what colors? It's just looking at my, at my um, documentation. So I have a really a good image that I'm working from. And then I just analyze the heck out of it. I work dark up to light. Um, I work a lot of painting right on the surface. So I work wet into wet. I'll, I'll put down a kind of a middle value and I'll, I'll, I'll pump darks into it and then lights into it and do most of the mixing right on the surface. But I, I'm, I'm so used to analyzing and mixing that I've gotten pretty fast at it. So to me, it's almost like a puzzle. So I have uh, a, a question that kind of goes off of that. Um, could you explain to us why you use red in particular? Um, so you, you, uh, you trace it out and then you put red over it. Do you yeah. always use red or why red? Uh, I think it's because it's just a luscious color. And so if there are any spots of the canvas that are a little bit leaner coverage of paint, you're not just gonna see bare canvas. You're gonna see that glow of that, that warm red coming up through. So I would, I, I would say that if you see these paintings in person and you look up close at them, you're gonna see little moments where that red canvas is kind of popping up through. And so I like what happens when that color resonates with the objects that I've painted on top of it. Does it also play into your shadows? Because you, you are an absolute master at kind of where the shadows are and everything and, and the, um, uh, where, where you have the light and the shadows. Do you well, think it plays think into that? It really does give me um, kind of a middle of the value scale value to, to build the painting off of. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not working completely from the lightest value to the darkest, I've already got midtones already established with that red. You know, I used to use gray, kind of a middle gray, mm -hmm. and and that works too. Uh, but that's going to give your painting an entirely cool feel. What happens when you have this this red color underneath is that it it almost makes the objects feel like they're glowing. That there's mm -hmm. just this kind of warm furnace underneath, and and I particularly like that. Um, in in this image. Sometimes I get a little bit frantic and a little bit nuts when I'm working on a painting this size. So I'll cordon off a little area like this upper corner. I'll just tape it off and it's like, today 
I'm just painting this. So you can tell that this is where I decided I wasn't going to be distracted by any other area. I was going to figure this out. Sometimes too, I will turn it upside down. And in that way, it really abstracts what it is that I'm looking at. And then I, I can see it with fresh eyes. It also helps because since these paintings are so big, sometimes I can't reach the top of them effectively. So when I turn them upside down, I'm able to, to reach them better. And here's a progress shot. So you can see how, how I would go about painting. So very loose at first, and then coming back over, pulling it up a little bit more, leaving a lot of the filigree out. Uh, but by the time you see the third image, you can tell that I have redrawn, repainted the, some of these cups because I was not happy with their ellipses and uh, moved things around a little bit. And then the detail is the last thing that, that happens. Same thing between this one and, and this. And what I learned is that I had to paint the cup first and then paint the filigree over the top of that. So it was, it was kind of a huge logic problem. So here's the, the before, that's the, the finish. And then this piece is also now hanging at the Georgia Museum of Art. Gives you a better idea of the scale. So also another six by six. Right. Uh -huh. These were... These were companion pieces. Mm -hmm. And then right now I have a show up at the Woodward Gallery in New York City. And this work was the work that I painted during summer quarantine. And I, since I couldn't come into my, my studio that I have here at the university, I was using my home studio that I literally hadn't painted in for about 10 years. And so uh, like the proverbial Hollywood movie, I was, I was dusting off old furniture and, and trying to kind of resuscitate this old space and kind of bring it back to life. Mm -hmm. And so started painting these little still lives. You can see them here installed in uh, New York City. Uh, and this will be up until the end of December. So for anyone that's in New York, um, is the gallery available to uh, go into and visit uh, or you, can you only see it from the windows? Uh, you can make an appointment. Uh, you can call ahead and you can see the work in person. That's awesome. And um, I particularly wanted to paint uh, more of these scenes from the antique market because it literally, you were talking about nostalgia earlier, this brought me so much joy during a very bleak and terrifying time. Uh, particularly since my Italian friends were on my mind too because mm -hmm. they were some of the first um, Europeans to be affected were, were the Italians and so um, I was, I was in communication with a lot of them, thinking about them often, and then decided to paint the, this series. And uh, I became intrigued at this point with, with some of the displays that were a little more chaotic than others. And I liken this to, to instead, of, instead of the French gardens at Versailles, like the silver and the, and the ceramic pieces, this is more like an English garden where the gardener just kind of wildly threw seeds wherever they, they were going to land. <laughs> and there was just kind of the sense of, of just joy with, with the, matter of fact, this painting is called Cacophony because there's really no rhyme nor reason to it. It's just, it's just kind of accidentally beautiful. So I really enjoyed that. Margaret, we have another question from the chat from Cynthia. Um, she asks, if you realize that the proportion of an object is wrong, how do you fix it? Oh, I just, this is why I love oil paint because it's so forgiving. I will just repaint it. I'll just redraw it and repaint it. You know, acrylics to me are not quite as forgiving, but gosh, oil paint, I don't have any trouble just wiping it off and starting over. 
How often have you had to do that? Oh, it's just part of my process. I'm constantly challenging my initial drawing and, and re kind of redrawing all my ellipses. I'll, I'm constantly challenging my proportions and, uh, and fine tuning as I go. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, there are a lot of changes that I make throughout. I think otherwise I would get bored. <laughs> and then here is my studio as it is uh, pretty much right now. And the pieces that you can see in the background are nine feet high by seven feet wide. And uh, <laughs> you can see my ladder over on the left-hand side. That was my present for my husband at Christmas time. That's so I could reach the top of the painting. <laughs> <laughs> Safety first. I, I, I like that you've got a bucket up there. And so to yes. encourage you not to stand on top of the ladder. Right. And it's got a little platform. And so I'm, I'm very careful when I'm climbing my ladder. Um, and then the, the piece that's actually on the easel is now up in, in New York City. And this is what I'm working on right now. That is um, wonderful. Um, thank you, Margaret. I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know your work and everything. Um, I had a, another question that kind of goes back to one I had earlier is that, um, again, how I was introduced to your, your paintings where it was just one object. Do you ever, uh, but I noticed the majority of the pictures that you showed us wasn't just one object. It's multiple, um, it's multiple shrimp, it's multiple cheeses, it's multiple um, uh, silver and, and what have you. And so do you ever go back to painting um, just an artichoke, just uh, an, a, a piece of food or, or do you tend to go towards these grander um, multiple object pieces? I, I will say that the last few years I've been doing these more uh, uh, packed, ornate still lives just, just because they're fun. And mm -hmm. a lot of this is just pure self-indulgence. Um, it reminds me when, when you were talking about the objects that are just singular objects, I almost mm -hmm. see those more like portraiture. And so oftentimes when I was painting, for example, that piece that I showed early on, just the, the glass of milk, mm -hmm. to me, that was like a little portrait. Mm -hmm. And there is part of me that, that longs to, to do that, to kind of go back and give that little mundane object its moment on the stage, its moment under a beautiful light source. And, and so, yeah, I, I think it, it's something that I'm constantly, you know, swinging back and forth between more complexity and then the kind of the, the simplicity of the beauty of one object. We have well, another yeah. question from the chat. Um, Christine, unless you had something else. Well, I, I thought I saw Lydia had raised her hand that she had a question. So maybe we go to Lydia first. Okay. Yeah. Margaret, I'm a collector. Okay. And our Muse Birmingham Museum of Art group came to Christine's gallery in probably 1999 or 2000, loved it. And, and as Christina alluded to, I've got some of your little portraits. I've got a glass of apple juice, which is exquisite. Oh, oh my God. And strawberry cream pie. Anyway, it goes on. <laughs> you and I have a mutual friend, Bill Island. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. We're college friends and are still in touch. So uh -huh. I'll have to email him and tell him that, that I saw you on screen. Tell him about this. Well, that's fabulous. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Rachel, do we have another one in the chat? Yeah, we have a question from Samira. She asks, how do you get the details on the glass? Oh, gosh, how? Um, well, I... I do like to build in those layers. And I have found that, that just starting simply and then going back and adding more, 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 and just kind of the level of analysis that goes into that is what keeps me really engaged. And I, and I like to play with how much information I can leave out and what I need to keep in for it to actually feel like it's optically accurate. 
because what I've noticed is if you put in too much information and it's, and it's too kind of photorealism, it's, it doesn't replicate the experience that the retina has when, when you're seeing objects from a certain distance. Mm -hmm. And so I'm more interested in how the eye sees than how the camera sees. Great. Um, Rachel, was there another one in the chat? Uh, I think that's it right now, but we're, we're almost at the end of time. So if you have a question, now, speak now or forever hold your peace. So I have another one, um, is <coughs> thinking back to your career and you said when you were in the museums, you became obsessed with the, the <coughs> detail, the, um, uh, like the, the water droplets, but you, you made sure to say several times, uh, the translucentness of, of glass. What did you, if you can remember, <laughs> uh, what do you feel like you started obsessing over for, and obsessing might be the wrong word, but like, did you really focus in, okay, I want to figure out how to, to draw and paint translucent glass, or was it more detail oriented? What do you, what did you feel like you went for first? I don't think it was necessarily detail as much as it was wanting to create the optical illusion mm -hmm. and being really fascinated that, that with something like colored dirt, you could make magic. And, mm -hmm. and I just thought that was fascinating. And I thought, I got to figure that out. And so I, I, I don't know, for some reason, I started painting in high school, but it seemed to click. And I've always just adored oil paint because I felt like I could, I could move it around like clay. It was very mm -hmm. malleable and, and I could, it was very forgiving. And I really liked being able to just paint right on the surface. So to me, it was about figuring out the optical illusion. Do you have one more question in the chat from Helen? Uh, for clear glass, what colors do you use mostly? Oh, for clear glass. That's a really great question because there's not a color to use. It's, it's painting what you see through the glass. Because if you just paint what you see beyond the glass, then the glass shows up. It's just part of that optical illusion. So that, you know, it would be handy if you had a tube that said glass on it, but it, it doesn't exist. And so you just literally have to think about what you're painting as, as you're seeing, looking through the glass. And then if you paint those distortions, those values, those colors, then automatically the glass is there. And it's like, oh, I just made magic. That's amazing. So are you having to like uh, redo the outline of the glass each time as you, as you kind of go through, or do you put that in last? Um, again, you, you probably be surprised that, that there are times when I'll lose edges on purpose mm -hmm. because if you go and outline everything, it, it doesn't resonate with how the retina sees the object. And so a lot of the time I will, I will lose edges. And uh, if, there's, if there is one color right up next to another color that is real similar, I won't show the difference between the two. And I guess that's what I'm curious about. What, what color of paint do you use to, when you do an edge of a clear glass vase, for example, what color do you use? Just uh, what do you start with? Gray or silver? Oh, you know, I, I think I'm looking more at value than color at that point. So if I'm looking at, if I, for example, I have a dark background and a lighter glass, then I'll probably, I'll probably draw in with a lighter line. If I've got a dark glass object against a light ground, then I'll go with a dark line. So I'm matching more of the value at that point than I am color. And once I get the value adjusted, then I look for what color I'm seeing. Does that help? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Um, let, let, me, let me grab this painting.
with this piece that I'm working on right now, <laughs> there's a place near the bottom, and I don't know if you can see this, yeah, um, yeah. that is plastic. And mm -hmm. so I just painted first what I had in the background and then painted that lighter strip of plastic uh, over the top of that. So I painted background first, painted mm -hmm. back up to front. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Great, well, I think we have time for one more question if there is uh, one more, Rachel. Um, nope, not right now. Great, okay. Well, thank you, Margaret. I have really enjoyed this. I feel like I could look at your paintings and talk to you all night. <laughs> but um, I'm going to switch us to, uh, or at least on my screen, to gallery view. And if you've been working on something, uh, I would love for you to turn on your camera and hold it up uh, so we can see what you've been working on. I won't lie, I cheated and did this right before. Because <laughs> uh, I, I never have time uh, when, we're, when we're all talking, but oh, great. Oh. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you so, so much for being part of this. Um, thank you for all your questions. And thank you, Margaret, uh, so much for, uh, for um, doing this and I being in the exhibition. Again, uh, if you missed it at the beginning, the exhibition is now up online, um, uab.edu forward slash Ava. Oh, Samira, that's great. Oh, we did the same one. Look at that. We did the same one. Um, <laughs> and so um, we, uh, we would love for you all to, to check it out so you can actually see the exhibition now. Um, and so again, uab.edu forward slash Ava. Uh, and thank you so, so much, Margaret. We really enjoyed having My you. My pleasure. Thank you, Christina.